Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the organisers for giving me the opportunity to speak to you about some of the work I've been doing with Barton's Feedback and more recently with Olaf Holm. Uh, at lunch today, um, one of the organisers was telling me that there's, um, was observing that, there's, that my talk is a little unusual at this string theory conference in being uh, one of the few talks about, actually about string theory. Um, but um, it would be interesting to speculate on what that might mean about the um, state of the field, but it would be invidious to do so here. So instead, I will um, start by telling you uh, about what I mean by dou what double field theory and what that's got to do with string theory. So in, if you look at strings on a torus, then states are ca are carry a momentum, P, and a winding number, W, both discrete. And if one looks at the string, this, the string gives rise to an infinite set of tower of fields. If there's only momentum, it, it, like in flat space, we would have uh, fields which would depend on momentum, or if we went into position space on the um, space-time coordinate X. Um, but um, in um, string theory, there's a duality, T-duality, which uh, mixes P and the momentum and winding, and so it's natural to um, use a formalism which uh, treats them on the same footing. And so it, one leads, one's led to considering a, an infinite set of fields which depend on both momentum and winding, or if one Fourier transforms on, on both a position X and the Fourier transform of the winding number, a new... Um, a new um, uh, uh, coordinate, periodic coordinate uh, conjugate um, to W. And um, so if X was a coordinate of uh, a circle of radius R, X tilde would be the coordinate of, a of the T-dual circle of radius 1 over R. And so in this way, we get, end up with a, an infinite set of fields which depend on these doubled chord, on this doubling, doubled space time, this doubling of coordinates. And this arises naturally um, from looking at the closed string field theory. And the closed string field theory, in fact, gives some um, mild form of non-locality in this doubled space involving co-cycles. And uh, it's interesting to look um, for a, a, a subsector, for example, a finite set of fields, which might, um, for example, um, uh, um, things, uh, the double generalization of the metric B field and dilaton. So this leads us to looking at a double field theory on a double torus. Uh, and the important point is that if one looks at general solutions of string theory, it will involve an infinite set of doubled fields. And uh, there are interesting and important um, kinds of um, solutions which, uh, which necessarily involve these uh, kinds of doubled fields, and these are needed um, for non looking at non-geometric backgrounds like T-folds. And I was thinking about these kinds of backgrounds which led, me to, which, which led to some of the ideas um, that I'll be talking about today. Uh, and I want to stress that there's um, a real dependence on the full double geometry, that the dual dimensions are not auxiliary or, or a gauge artifact, and that the double geometry is both physical and dynamical, as I'll try and explain. Uh, this has a number of, this uh, formalism has a number of novel features. There's a novel symmetry which reduces to, which reduces to diffeomorphisms and B-field transformations in half dimension, when, when uh, the fields are independent of half the coordinates. And, it's, and it works for any um, half of the coordinates. Uh, backgrounds which depend on X are conventional backgrounds which are seen by particles, whereas ones which depend on the dual coordinates are seen by winding modes. And um, ones which depend on both would have a number of unfamiliar features. One thing which I find particularly interesting about these kinds of, um, this, this kind of analysis is it captures some of the exotic and complicated structure of the interacting string. Uh, the closed string field theory is non-polynomial, has a complicated algebraic structure based not on a Lie algebra, but on a something more general called a homotopy Lie algebra. It features various co-cycles and projectors, and a lot of these are, folk, uh, are captured in the doubled field theory. And in particular, be, uh, uh, the hope, one of the aims was to try and look for a simpler context in the full closed string field theory to understand some of these features, and this in turn uh, might feed back into understanding the full string theory better. Uh, T-duality is very important in this fr framework, and the, t and the symmetry which uh, T-duality is a manifest symmetry uh, in all that I'll be talking about today. And in particular, it leads to a generalization of the conventional T-duality of, um, talked about by Boucher and others, and in particular, it includes the case of um, where there are no isometries, but there's still uh, a, general a generalization of T-duality to the case where there's no isometries. And I should mention there's some important earlier work on uh, double fields uh, by Warren Siegel and Arkady Saitlin some time ago. 
So let me uh, try and uh, let me try, um, set, introduce some notation and set things up more carefully. I'll be looking at a target space which has got a product of a Minkowski space and a spatial D torus, um, n dimensional Minkowski space, and the total dimension will uh, typically be 26 or 10, depending on which string I'm talking about. Um, we'll have coordinates xi, which include x mu on, uh, for the Minkowski space and xa for, on the torus. There are corresponding momenta. Um, and winding numbers and uh, corresponding dual coordinates. And I'll introduce um, a constant background metric, G, capital G, and a constant background B field, capital B. So if we look in the compact dimensions on this D torus, P and A are, uh, the momentum P and the uh, winding W are discrete, and they take values in the Narayan lattice. And the corresponding um, coordinates are periodic. Um, the Fourier transforms of these discrete variables naturally give periodic variables. So here we get a double torus. We have the original torus with coordinates x a and d more circles with coordinates x tilde a. Uh, in the non-compact dimensions, the, convent the usual momentum and position are continuous. And we'll usually uh, take um, the winding number in these non-compact dimensions to be 0 winding modes would be infinitely massive. And so uh, the fields will be independent of x tilde, so uh, we'll be looking at this. But it will be useful to um, carry along the possibility of having an x tilde mu and a w mu to, to um, simplify the notation. T-duality interchanges momentum and winding in the compact dimensions and leads to an equivalence of string theories in dual backgrounds with very different geometries and topologies in general. Uh, string theory uh, is, a, is a string field theory. This is a s symmetry provided the fields depend on both x and x tilde. And the string field theory, which um, demonstrated this, was set up by Kugo and Svebak some time ago. Uh, for fields which depend on just on the um, non-compact coordinates, then uh, and don't depend on the toroidal coordinates or their duals, we have the conventional Boucher rules for the t-duality transformations. Uh, and in some work I was doing some time ago with Atish Dabalkar, we were looking at generalizing this to fields, um, to cases um, with fields which depend on both x and x tilde. And we'll be talk And it's this kind of generalized t duality which works here, which will be which I'll be talking about later today. Um, quite possibly, where? So, uh, so for Boucher, I want fields which depend just on the non-compact coordinates and not on the circular coordinates x a and the dual coordinates x tilde a. So they depend on the base coordinates, but not on the, so the, um, the usual Boucher rules require isometries in the torus direction, so they're independent of x a. So, the, so we're looking at fields like this, not the general fields. Is that okay? Does that answer your question? Um, I'll, this, this, I'll be making this more precise later, so I'll, perhaps it will be clearer later. So if we look at um, Barton Svebak's closed string field theory, we have, an inf we have a f a s fields which depend on loops, x of sigma, and also some ghost loops. And expanding x of sigma gives rise to, um, so here I'm first looking first in Minkowski space, and I'll modify this for the torus in a moment. So we have the center of mass position and an infinite set of oscillators. Expanding in the oscillators gives an infinite set of, an infinite tower of fields of increasing masses. And integrating out the massive fields gives a field theory for the massless fields in the familiar way. So as a similar story on the torus, but now the fields will give rise to dependence also on these dual coordinates x tilde, and expanding will give an infinite set of doubled fields. And um, so for the full string theory, you get an infinite set of doubled fields. And in some cases, we might be able to um, look for a finite subsector. And I'll be saying more about that later. So if we look at the free field equations in the case where there's no background B field, just to simplify, then we have the familiar field equations from the string. Um, here, n and n bar are the left and right moving uh, oscillator number. And um, this one, the first one in the string field theory is treated as the field equation, and there's a kinetic operator in the doubled space, um, which is the Fourier transform of this, which looks like this. And this one is treated as a constraint on the doubled fields. Um, so here we have an, another um, second-order differential operator. 
And both of these can be thought of as Laplacians for two different metrics. This is um, the Laplacian for, the, for an ODD invariant metric, and this is a Laplacian for um, a metric like this, made from the original space-time metric. And this we'll see, um, see is, a case, is what I'll call later a generalized metric in the case when b equals zero. So it's interesting that um, string field theory treats these, treats these rather differently, and it would be interesting to see if there was some way of treating them both on the same footing, but um, our attempts to do that didn't work. And at the level n equals n bar equals one, so the intercept is chosen for the bosonic string, there's a similar story for other strings, um, then we get these um, three fields which are at this level, which satisfy these um, two um, double massless equations. So we'll, we have an, a, a, an infinite set of constrained fields, each of which satisfy a, a, a constraint of this kind, where this is p dot w, and um, the mu depends on the, on the, on the oscillator numbers. So um, if we're looking at momentum space, the momentum space has got dimension n plus 2d. I'm assuming there's no dependence on the winding in the non-compact dimensions. So, um, and the, this um, equation, if for the massless ones, gives a cone, or if we have a mu here, we get a hyperboloid in this doubled space, and so in this momentum space, and so we get a, um, something which has just got one dimension less. And so the double field theory talks about fields on these cones or hyperboloids with, with uh, the extra constraint, the momentum and winding are discrete. And one of the problems is the naive products of fields which lie on the cone or um, which lie on the cone do not lie on, do not lie on the cone and similarly for, for the corresponding hyperboloids. And for this reason in the string field theory and hence in the um, double field theory, the vertices will need explicit projectors. However, there's a subclass of the full double string, th double field theory, or the full string field theory, where we look at restricted fields, and these are fields which depend on just half of the double torus coordinates, um, or momenta. So if we have fields which are independent of winding, or fields which are independent of the toroidal um, momentum, then um, those fields are mutually local amongst themselves, and if we just restrict ourselves to a set of fields which um, just depend on these uh, or just depend on these, then we find a, 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 a simple closed subset to where no projectors or co-cycles are needed, because two product of two fields of this form will again be of that form. And uh, by looking at the restricted subclass, one can make um, some extra progress, as we'll see. So I'll be looking at a torus background where we have um, a metric, which has got Minkowski metric and then some um, in the non-compact dimensions and then a compact um, and then some constant metric here on the internal dimensions and a B field in the internal, uh, on the in internal torus. And I'll use capital E to denote the metric whose symmetric part is G and anti-symmetric part is B. And I'll be looking at fluctu fluctuations about these um, backgrounds. Um, so for this slide, I'll uh, to simplify things by taking the background B to be zero, but there's, um, that just to simplify these formulae, but in the papers we have the full case. Then um, defining uh, grad tilde this way, we can compare with the usual action. If we take the usual action for um, 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 the metric and B field and dilaton, and um, we can look at the quadratic part of this, and it'll be useful to, so we have the terms quadratic in H and B, and it'll also be useful to define a variable little d by this formula, and this has the important property that under the usual Boucher rules for t-duality, under which um, the dilaton shifts and the metric transforms, this combination is invariant. And so this variable little d is t-duality invariant and is a natural variable to talk, use in this context and is um, more convenient to use than phi. So it's just a field redefinition relating these. So, so then um, in terms of this, so the... The, quadra the, um, the, the double field theory action will be written in terms of this, or we can be expressed in ter related to this Lagrangian, and it takes this form. So we have, we're now integrating over um, the double coordinates, and here we have um, the original action, um, which we talked about before, and then we have a, a t-dual action. This is the one where we have this derivative replaced by the dual derivative, and this, these are the um, terms which you'd get by forming a, li a linearized t-duality transformation. 
And um, so that if we had fields which were just depended on x, we'd just get this term. And if we had fields which just depended on x tilde, we'd get this term. And so these are the two terms you might expect. Then there's some strange mixed terms in which involve both kinds of both um, original and dual derivatives and mixing between the metric and the B field. And this uh, action has an interesting invariance. This inv showing this invariance needs using the constraint I mentioned. Um, but um, here we see that if we have fields which are independent of, if we have parameters epsilon and epsilon tilde, which are independent of the dual coordinates x tilde, we get this term, which is the usual linearized diffeomorphism transformations, and this term, which are the usual B-field transformations. But then we see that um, if we have, look at the dependent field parameters which have just de dependence on x tilde, we get, um, here we get something which you might think of as dual uh, diffeomorphisms, and these are some kind of dual B-field transformations. So it's very interesting that these transformations um, put, treat the metric and the B-field transformations in a very symmetrical way, fit them together in this way, and, um, and, and indeed mix them together in the general case. And we, this is the term for the quadratic uh, double field theory action. And for the full double field theory, uh, uh, we construct, uh, with Barton, I constructed the cubic action and showed that that is in, indeed invariant under um, these transformations plus um, field-dependent corrections. And the, this theory has got a, a T-duality invariance. The, we have the familiar transformations of the background. So here I'll be looking at T-duality transformations, which are the identity on the non-compact coordinates and act as the ODDZ transformations on the periodic coordinates. And the background transforms in the familiar way under the fractional linear transformation. There's a natural action on the um, coordinates, which transform linearly. And the T-duality is a symmetry of the full action. Here we're including fluctuations around the background, which depend on both x and x tilde. And um, here we have the transformations uh, in which E transforms and D transform in ways involving this ma these matrices defined in this way. And here we see that um, the, um, the x transforms to x primed. And so D is no longer invariant, but X transforms as, a, as what one might call a scalar under these. And so here we're looking at um, fluctuations around the background, which have got general momentum and winding dependence. So here we're seeing the first hint of the, uh, the first um, formulation of the generalized T-duality transformation. So I mentioned that the naive product of constrained fields doesn't satisfy the constraint. The product of two fields, A and B, which satisfy, which are killed, annihilated by this um, second order differential, differential operator won't, uh, won't satisfy that equation. So for this, to deal with these, uh, uh, these property, the string product in the string field theory um, has explicit projections onto the kernels of the corresponding uh, operators. And this leads to a symmetry which is not a Lie algebra, but is um, a more general algebraic um, structure. And the double field theory requires such, uh, also requires such projections. It, I mean, it inherits them from the string field theory. The string field theory also has non-local co-cycles co appearing in the vertices, and so the double field theory also inherits these. Um, but it turns out that for kinematic reasons, in the cubic action, these are not needed. Um, but for this reason, the, um, looking at the quartic and higher terms is action, in the action it becomes much, much harder, and, we, um, and that hasn't been completed yet. So if we look at general uh, double fields, um, they depend on both x and x tilde. Um, there's a special case space of conventional fields which depend on the space-time coordinates. We can also look at um, fields which, should, which just depend on um, some set of coordinates which are t-dual to the original set. So both, so acting on x, but not, um, will trans, might transform the x to the x tildes or some subclass of those. Um, but in each case, we get um, a, a subspace, which is um, a dual space with respect to this um, ODD invariant metric. And if we look at a subsector with fields and parameters all restricted to either space-time or its image under a T-duality, then we get a much simpler um, structure. The constraint is automatically satisfied for such restricted fields and their products. 
no projectors or co-cycles are needed. Um, the, the theory is T-duality covariant and it's in, in that it's independent of the choice of N. Um, and, and this has the feature that one can find the full nonlinear form of the gauge transformations and the full gauge algebra. And the hope is that this will give, shed some light onto the full unrestricted theory. So I'm going to now um, say some details, some of the details we found about how this works for the restricted double fields. So we're looking at um, fields which are restricted to some half-dimensional subspace, and T-duality will rotate this to another um, N to another N, N and N primed. It turns out that there's a background independent combination of the fields, which um, gives rise to defined in this way, by, where this is defined by as a matrix, um, as a matrix inverse. Um, and here we, and this defines a metric and a B field as the symmetric and anti-symmetric parts of this. And we, it's useful to introduce an ODD covariant notation, where we, here we have the ODD invariant metric and combine um, the, the coordinates and their derivatives into um, doubled vectors. So the um, T-duality transformation as before is of this kind. And um, in, this, um, in this case, we, what we find is that the transformations, the full nonlinear form of the transformations under T-duality now can be written in closed form. Uh, and it has this, this, this form. So in the case of the Boucher rules, X and X primed are the same because the fields, are, the fields only depend on the parts of the x's, the non-compact coordinates which don't transform under the t-duality. And so this gives the generalization to the case without isometries and um, indeed uh, re reproduces a lot of the results that I was, uh, a lot of the um, structure which was found in my paper with Atish. Now, um, there's a sense in which there's a, 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 a higher covariance. So let me explain what that means. Um, there's, if we look, if the non-compact dimensions are X and P are continuous, and for strings, we certainly want to take W equals zero, and um, so the fields are independent of X tilde. Um, but for the double field theory, it, we could um, generalize this a little, and we could um, formally at least allow dependence on, this dual, on a dual coordinate X tilde. And in this case, the double field theory would be invariant under um, continuous transformations on the non-compact coordinates, and as well as the discrete ones which um, preserve the periodicities. Um, so this is the subgroup of ODD which preserves the periodicities. And what we find is that the, the results, the action we find is something which is ODD covariant um, if all the directions were non-compact. And then um, it, um, and so the theory has a formal ODD covariance. Although I stress that in the application to string theory, we really want to take um, no winding in the um, non-compact directions. So there's a natural, so natural way of formulating th um, the theory in terms of a variable which is sometimes called the generalized metric because of its where it arises in something called generalized geometry. But really, it's a, metric, it's a metric on this doubled space. It's a conventional metric on this doubled space, which is constructed from the metric and the B field. And it takes, um, locally, it could, it could be thought of as taking this form. And so on this doubled space, we have two different metrics. They have this um, curly H and this eta. And this H could be thought of as a, as a metric which satisfies this constraint. So here, um, we. Here and in what follows, I'll be using this metric eta to raise and lower coordinates, lower, raise and lower indices. So if we raise the indices on uh, h, we get this. And this h satisfies a constraint. It's not a free metric, but it's constrained and, um, to satisfy, so that um, raising the indices gives the inverse of the original metric. And this provides a number of algebraic constraints. And the general solution is that it can be written in terms of a, um, a g and a b in this way. And this has the feature that the nonlinear transformations of G and B have now become linearized. That this, this now transforms under um, T-duality transformations as in a covariant way in this way. And again, note that um, X transforms to X primed in this formula. So it's a tensorial type transformation. And we found um, the ODD covariant action um, in terms of these variables takes a very simple form. Um, it, 
and it has a remarkable property that it's cubic in these fields, that this L is, is cubic in these fields, um, remembering that H with the upper indices is not the in is, um, is defined as H with the indices raised by um, or lowered with eta. And it's invariant under these gauge transformations. And um, we can rewrite this as defining a, something which we'll refer to as a generalized lead derivative. So let's say a little bit about this. We can define this Lie derivative on general objects with, say, with um, any number of upper or lower indices. So, for example, if there's one upper and one lower index, we get structures like this, which we can rewrite as the normal Lie derivative plus terms which have got explicit metrics, um, eta, raising and lowering indices. So um, this term has got um, the, the index on the derivative and on the parameter in the wrong places. They're raised and lowered with etas. Thank you. Um, so we get this, um, this structure here, and um, this is, um, this is um, close related to a generalized Lie derivative talked about by, uh, in a paper by um, Grania, Waldrum, Minarsian, and Petrini. Um, we can write the Lagrangian as a generalized scalar curvature, um, and which um, defined in this way, uh, which has um, transforms co covariantly in this sense under these transformations. And um, the two if we look at the two derivative action, there's terms with two not conventional derivatives, two dual derivatives, and a mixed term. We can, we can rewrite the S0 in terms of usual fields, giving the usual action plus a surface term. Um, the second term, the last term, is a T-dual version of that, and S1 gives strange mixed terms of, of the linearized form of which we've seen before. So for the restricted double field theory, the fields are independent of half the coordinates. Um, if it's independent of x tilde, it's equivalent to the usual action. We've just seen that here. If, it's, if, there's, if the derivative with respect to x tilde vanishes for all the fields, these two terms vanish, and we just get the conventional action here up to a surface term. Um, but the theory is t-duality covariant, and its duality is, um, du and duality changes which half the coordinates the theory is independent of, but, uh, and, but always take restricted fields to restricted fields. Uh, this um, home and quack sh showed that this th um, theory is equivalent to um, an earlier formulation of the theory uh, by Warren Siegel, um, using, constructed using a rather different approach. And um, one, one of the um, features of this action is it's something which is a natural, gives, provides a natural framework for discussing uh, certain kinds of non-geometric backgrounds. Um, because it enables us, it gives a natural way of formulating um, certain kinds of non-geometry. Um, so time's running short, so maybe I'll skip um, a discussion of the um, gauge algebra and um, say a little bit about um, generalized geometry and extension to M theory. The generalized geometry um, is, is uh, as a, an approach to describing uh, spaces with a Betrick and a B field in which there's a natural action of ODD. Um, uh, it's just um, initialized by Nigel Hitchin and extended by um, Marco Galtieri, and in particular involves doubling of the tangent space, replacing it by the sum of the tangent and cotangent spaces, um, uh, but leaving the space, the actual manifold, intact, whereas the double field theory doubles the coordinates. This also features in features doubling the tangent space automatically, and so there's a lot of so a lot of the tensor structure in generalized geometry and in the double field theory um, are, are very similar. But I want to stress that the double field theory really does um, do something different. It's looking at a more general class of spaces, whereas the, the generalized geometry is really looking at what one might call conventional manifolds with conventional um, objects on them. So um, this can be extended to, um, from t-duality to u-duality. Um, there's, uh, there's some, ex we can ex look at um, extended geometries where one extends the tangent space in such a way that we can formulate a metric and a three-form gauge field, um, possibly uh, um, with other gauge fields, with perhaps with their, perhaps with dual field, uh, dual form fields, in such a way that instead of the action, natural action of ODD, there's a natural action of the U duality group, and there's been extensions of the double of the restricted double field theory to rewritings of the eleven-dimensional action in terms of um, variables of the kind used in this um, extended geometry. So in double field theory, um, uh, the, once looking at, um, we've, we've constructed the 
unrestricted double field theory um, with a cubic action for the fields G, B, and D, the quartic and higher terms should have many features of the string field theory involving co-cycles, projectors, um, and a symmetry based on a homotopy Lie algebra. Um, one of the issues which is uh, as yet unresolved is whether there's um, really an unrestricted gauge invariant action for, um, the full un uh, for the full double field theory involving G, B, and D alone, um, in which the massive or, or are the massive fields in inevitably needed. Um, the, the hope is that there's a sense in which you can integrate out um, these massive fields in a consistent way to get a, um, a gauge invariant action for these alone. Um, and that's um, work in progress. It says the features that it um, involves um, a, two, a, a, a manifest T-duality symmetry, which, um, and which means that it's very natural for looking at various issues to do with T-duality. And uh, it enables us to look at um, a number of stringy issues in simpler setting than would arise in string field theory. And there's a number of features where one has both momentum and winding at the same time, which give rise to a no no number of novel structures. Um, we've looked at a, I've looked at a, we also at the restricted double field theory where we have the, um, the fields restricted to um, a, a half dimensional subspace and we have the full nonlinear background independent theory and um, shown that it's duality covariant and found the generalized um, T duality rules which um, apply in this case, the full nonlinear theory. And there are a number of things which are still remaining to be understood about this. For example, what is the, um, underlying geometry of this, although there's been some interesting work on that. Um, and um, it'd be interesting to um, develop the use of these um, for non-geometric backgrounds. One of, the, um, th one of the things which is perhaps uh, hardest to um, think about generalizing is the following. Uh, we understand dualities for um, spaces which are tor involve tori or torus vibrations or calabials or for um, very special kinds of internal geometries. But in, for general, general space times, we um, don't know um, whether there's any analog of these um, dualities or what would replace them. Um, the, doubling, uh, the doubling story is very specific to the case of tori, and there's a question about what would happen for more general spaces if one didn't have a... Um, um, so, for example, for general spaces, the number of winding modes and the number of momentum modes might be very different. So. Um, this whole doubling story seems to be rather um, specific to uh, the case of tori or, or spaces with torus vibrations. Um, but nonetheless, it's, um, it's, it's giving, uh, I think it gives a formulation which seems to get, which gives a lot of insight into some of the structure of um, string theory. And um, I want to stress that double geometry is both physical and dynamical. There are these, um, I, I showed the field, the linearized field equations um, earlier, which involve, um, evolution in both the x and the x tilde um, dir directions um, in a rather interesting way. Um, so um, I'm out of time, so let me um, f finish by just flashing a slide. Uh, there's been a lot of other wo interesting work and um, other developments, so let me just um, stop here and um, show this slide with um, a lot of other interesting work and references. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Questions? Um, okay, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I could be more explicit about some of the cases where one has. Um, which arise in sort of Shirk Schwartz type reductions where it has a torus fibered over a circle, for example. Um, and in that case, what it says is it, um, I mean, in my paper with Atish, we had some um, suggestions for what um, T duality should do, in particular, what, what you would call um, the, um, the dual uh, theory which had R flux, would then be, would then it would follow from this, would give rise to the um, case where you had a torus bundle over, the dual, over a dual circle, which in other words is fibered over X tilde. So, um, so to, to, to treat that, one needs to be a bit more careful and allow things where, instead of things where in patches you have the, um, the kind of structure I was talking about, but then one would use all the symmetries of the theory to, uh, to patch things together in overlaps, and in that way one would be able to look at more general bundles. Uh, and in that way, um, 
the kind of structure which would be which is um, occurred in the lit which has occurred in a lot of these suggested in a lot of places in the literature for these kinds of structures actually arises from this formalism. Any more questions? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks.